raspberry plum waffle today. James is having some pineapple with his raspberry and plum. Awesome. And he's going to review Chechnya and the plot to kill Kennedy and Castro. Cuba opens secret files. That's yep. the So there you go. Okay. And the Chechnya is to the heart of a conflict. There's not much heart there on either side, really. But, uh, you know, like it's Chechnya and uh, uh, Putin. And, of course, the real heartlessness is on Putin's side. So, I, before we get on to uh, Putin and Chechnya, I want to mention Putin. Way to go, Ukraine! Apparently they hit uh, maybe the biggest ship in the Russian Black, Fe Black Sea Fleet. Some people were claiming on the CBC that it was their biggest ship overall. And uh, called the Moskva. Now, Ukraine, don't hit Moskva, Moscow. Uh, show uh, that you're way more civilized than the Popo Bruskis are. And, uh, you know, like uh, Putin's response uh, to this, well, initially it was, hey, we just had a little fire on the ship. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, I think they were saying, we're towing it back in. And somewhere along the line during towing, maybe a little bit before, uh, it sunk. And I think the Russians are hiding how many people died. The Ukrainians generally have allowed, it looks like, uh, the UN or something like that, to give the figures for civilians dead, uh, 1,400, and that, I feared, is a very, very conservative figure. So I think they've been pretty responsible about the figures they've been uh, throwing around. Uh, the Russians are, are ridiculous. But... Some people are conjecturing maybe 50 people, well, the Ukrainians are saying 50 uh, Russians survived, and that's out of a crew of maybe 500. And uh, I don't want to wish will, uh, ill to people, but, you know, anyone who's on that ship, you know, like, you've got to be a conscientious objector. You've got to be a refugee out of Russia. If you're going into a war like this, you cannot, you cannot participate in it. You are committing war crimes, even down to the lowest level. If you're a conscript, maybe, I don't know how many conscripts, maybe it's, so, it's not so bad, but uh, I don't know how many conscripts they'd have on the ship. I think the conscripts would tend to be uh, grunts in the army. So uh, I'm actually, um, like, uh, that's pretty good, but uh, that many die. You've got to, what the Ukrainians have got to do, because the rest of the world really isn't helping out that much. Like, the Europeans have said, hey, we're cutting down, we're cutting off uh, carbon imports from the uh, Soviet Union. Not cool. gas, not yeah. natural gas, not, uh, not, uh, not oil, but coal. I, uh, hey, you know, like, we're, we're, we're not bringing in a couple of lumps of coal, which is what we were bringing in before. I'm exaggerating, of course, but uh, I'm trying to make a point. The Europeans have got to get serious about this sort of stuff because, you know, there's this uh, highlight reel thing of uh, a real nasty guy, a guy called Stevens. Forget his name, first name. Nasty guy used to play, I think, for the New Jersey Devils. And it, the team was appropriately named, at least given that he was on the team. And he uh, knocks a guy, silly, maybe even borderline unconscious, with a, what then was a legal check. It shouldn't have been legal. It's legal, but immoral. It's the kind of thing in hockey I'd never do if I were playing hockey. Uh, at any rate, even with nasty, nasty guys like Gordie Howe, or this, this Stevens guy, but what happens is uh, the Europeans should be keeping in mind even though they don't terribly like hockey. Uh, what happened, some of the people on the uh, opposition bench are chirping at uh, Stevens. And you can see, he wouldn't be whispering it. He's just saying out loud to them, you're next. Europe, you're next. And it's not just people who are border, bordering on uh, the former Soviet Union. It's all of you. Because of idiot 
i.e. Putin, takes over the Ukraine, he's going to be hammering you with whatever you have been importing out of the Ukraine. And that's just a, uh, a kind of like a preliminary step. He'll be trying to take over Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, even though they're in NATO, because they're, he's going to be blackmailing you. You got it? He's going to be blackmailing you. Hey, I, we know you're in NATO and stuff like that, but what you going to do about it? You don't want uh, oil imports cut off. You don't want natural gas cut off and uh, stuff like that. You've got to stop him now because what he wants to do is what Saddam Hussein wanted to do way back in 1990 thereabouts, which was corner the market on the world's oil. Get the get ultimately control 50% of it, and then he'd be saying, "What you gonna do? I want to take over Kuwait. I want to take over this. I want to take over that. I'm going to develop nuclear weapons. What you gonna do? I'm 50% of the oil, or control 50% of the oils, world's oil resources. In other words, he wouldn't have had to march too far beyond Kuwait and the Saudi Arabia. And Kuwait 10%. He already controls 10, 20% in Iraq. That's 20%. But Plus the 20% of world's oil resources uh, to be found in um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, just most of it is just within marching, a goose stepping distance of the quick. And then uh, you know, once he'd done that, he would have just said to Iran, "Oh, okay, you know, like uh, we, you've got Arabs over there. We've got Shiite Arabs here in the south of Iraq." You in this little postage stamp size area in the southwest of Iran, you've got about 10% of the world's oil resources, and there are Arabs there. And I'm an Arab nationalist. We're going to take that over. Sorry about that, guys, but uh, you know, like the world's not going to do anything about it because we already control 40% of the world's oil resources. So this is the way uh, th these idiots think. You know, they uh, they will take whatever you allow them to take. And you've got to stop now. I saw, I'm not a big fan of The Economist magazine coming out of England. Uh, they tend to be global uh, capitalists. They're global corporatists, uh, capitalist corporatists. I'm not a big fan of that sort of stuff. But uh, they had something, uh, for once they had the truth on their cover. And what it said was, I didn't uh, stop to read the magazine or anything like that. It's, what is it? Putin must not win. It's stronger than that. He's got to lose. In Ukraine, he's got to lose. You've got to, Europe, United States, you have got to provide the Ukrainians with enough equipment, and I'm talking about not just defensive equipment, offensive equipment, they should be told, you don't st set a foot inside oh, of Russia. I didn't put the cover on yeah. and I have a wet bum now. Yeah, oh, <laughs> it's quite dry over here. But you... <laughs> You've uh, got to give them enough weapons. You tell them, don't go into Russia, as it was constituted uh, after 1991. But you do go into the Crimea, even though the Russians have declared it uh, their territory. That's what they did there was illegal. And you do take over the People's Republic of Luhansk and the so called People's Republic of Luhansk and uh, People's Republic of Donbass. They've got to, Europe and the United States, talking to you, they've got to take that and those places away from Russia, and it's got to be shown to the Russian people that Putin is what he is, a loser. He's a loser. It's like the best analysis I've seen, heard of. It was on some person that they actually had was relatively competent and relatively honest on the CBC. And uh, what this guy said is he's he's played uh, he straight played really strongly with a really weak hand. Okay? He's played strongly with a weak hand. Now he's playing he has nothing in his hand. There's no matchers in his hand. He's walked into a huge bear trap and you've got to spring it on him. Or else it just keep on going until, you know, like it gets closer and closer to the places that really matter, like Germany, okay? Even Poland. Got that straight? Finland. Finland and Sweden, I encourage you to join NATO. You were, uh, 
you were living, uh, you know, like a, in a fool's paradise. You were very lucky. The United States was willing to shoulder the burden in terms of, of funding uh, military to keep the Soviets out of your back and front yards in your houses. They were a bunch of cowards, and there were a whole bunch, at least your ancestors, a whole bunch of you complaining about American imperialism, and now you're running to them. You were protected from Russian imperialism all through the Cold War by American non-imperialism. America didn't take over France, didn't take over Germany. They occupied it for about six years, from 45 to uh, 51. But they set up a democracy that has been relatively stable. France, they didn't set up a democracy there, and it's been less stable. They had a coup in 58. They got rid of their parliamentary system. And uh, then de Gaulle set up a uh, kind of like a... Uh, uh, he was kind of like a, a king that got re-elected. He didn't have much of an empire, uh, so he wasn't an emperor. didn't have much to start off with, and uh, it got uh, substantially smaller. So... Uh, you have got to. You've got to get serious. Uh, Europe, uh, you better get Finland, especially Finland, as well as Sweden, into, I think, have they applied to NATO? I think it's more like, yeah, it's, uh, NATO. And uh, European Union, I encourage you to uh, let Ukraine into the European Union. Uh, NATO, uh, eventually, Ukraine has got to belong to NATO, but right now, you don't take them in. Why? And of course it's not on the agenda. Because they've got to be able to take back the so-called People's Republic of Luhansk and the People's Republic of Donbass and the uh, so-called, I don't know what they call it, province or state of, the, of Russia, uh, the stolen uh, state of um, Crimea. They've got to be able to take it back. Then as soon as they do, they should be members of NATO. So if uh, Russia tries to, the empire tries to strike back. Uh, then it will be World War IV in all its glory if they decide to do that. So uh, this is, uh, I might not get around to this, uh, the plot to kill Kennedy and Castro because I've talked a lot about uh, Ukraine. But this has to bear on the Ukraine. Chechnya to the heart of a conflict. When was this put out? 2003 and the second edition, 2005. So, you know, a lot of people were going, hey, you know, Putin thought this would be like a, like a weekend war or a week-long war when he walked into Ukraine. And then they thought, hey, he's just improvising, you know, like uh, this attacking civilians and threatening this, that, and the other thing. Hey, you know, when he came to power, well, you probably don't. You probably don't care that much. But uh, for the ones who care, and the ones who don't know. Yeah. Some, some of you would know, and that's good. He came to power in 2000, as I recall. But you know, he was, um, he was kind of like the second in command to uh, Yeltsin, his predecessor, for a little while there, in 1999. Well, that's one of the first things he did. He uh, kind of settled something, handled something that Yeltsin wasn't able to handle in 1994. Through 1996, the Chechens, quite rightly, wanted independence from Russia after the Soviet Union broke down. They were still in the so-called Russian Federation, and uh, they are not. You know, the Russians aren't native to there. Chechens aren't even into Europeans. There are people that are close to. Yeah, it looks as though they border on them, North Ossetia. They're Indo-Europeans. They might be related to ancient Scythians or Scythians, however you want to mispronounce it. Kind of like a, a Iranian kind of people, related to the Persians, just judging from their language. So they're, they're the natives of that area. Actually, Russia is not, shouldn't have any access to any water anywhere, to the Arctic Ocean, to the Pacific Ocean, via the Sea of Okhotsk or through Vladivostok. They have no right to any access, it's not just in Ukraine, any access 
to the Black Sea. They have no right, uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, they have no right really to the Caspian Sea, the biggest sea in the world. And it's an eternal sea. So it doesn't, uh, you know, it's, it's less of a problem. Uh, the main people are going to have the problem of Turkmenistan, formerly of the Soviet Union, and uh, a place called Iran. But, uh, you know, like, uh, I believe uh, the big hero of Vladimir Putin was Peter the Great. And one of the things he achieved was getting Russian access to the Black Sea. When was Peter the Great ruling? Maybe something like uh, 1785 to 1823, somewhere around there. Uh, so somewhere around 1700, uh, probably a little bit later, he got access to the Black Sea. He's the first Russian ruler to do that. Wow, that's fascinating. No right to any, any access to the Black Sea, as well as the Arctic Ocean, and really to the Baltic Sea, because you see their big port there, St. Petersburg, or whatever they call it now, Leningrad, I don't know when a dude is going to, Putin's going to rechristen it, uh, Leningrad, maybe he's going to call it Putingrad, I don't know, but uh, it was stolen from the Finns. They actually should have no access to any of the world's great oceans, so up to the Baltic Unfortunately, unfortunately, depending on, uh, you know, when we're looking at the Russian access, uh, it, it shouldn't, no, I'm not saying that uh, St. Petersburg should be given back to the Finns, because you'd have a huge, huge whack of Russians that'd be part of Finland, and they'd be a horrible fifth column, you've seen what they've done, well, maybe you haven't seen, maybe you don't care, but they've been a horrible fifth column in the eastern and southern part of Ukraine. So, uh, but uh, all access through the Baltic should be closed off. It should be Estonia on one side and Finland on the other side. No access for the Russians. Uh, that should be the Baltic there at the mouth of, once you get past the mouth of the Neva, should not be allowed to be part of the Soviet Union or Russia. I, I consider it Soviet Union uh, 2.0. It, it, they should be blocked from running uh, submarines hither to the Nyan, especially with uh, missiles with nuclear tips on them and uh, stuff like that. But anyway, he decided to walk into Putin, decided to walk into Chechnya back in 1999. I believe it was November of 1999. This is even before he came, came to full power. He was Belson's second in command at that point in time. And he thought it was going to be a weekend war. I understand this guy has got backup plans he doesn't really improvise that much he's not that bright people are walking around saying he's smart okay he's not really that intelligent what he's fairly good at is tactics not very good at strategy he's been locking out with really weak hands Russia is a hundred and twenty Russia has a hundred and twenty million Russians in it there are about 30 million non-Russians in it, but the people that he can rely on to fight are 120 million Russians. How many Ukrainians are there? There's 40 million of them, non-Russians. His population base is only three times what the Ukraine is. That's insane odds. I don't know exactly what the population, I haven't been able to check it up uh, because you get populations for countries and stuff like that. But I'd be a little bit surprised if Chechen's population was much over uh, 10% or one-tenth of the Ukrainian population. What did he stomp in there with? Back in 1999, it took him four months to pacify them. And understand, the pacification that he does doesn't have much to do with the root packs of pacification, peace. It doesn't have much to do with peace. It's just, what did he do back then? He just flattened Grozny. Okay? Flattened Grozny. This is what he's doing to the Ukraine. This is what he did in Syria, created this huge, big refugee crisis, and it's probably still going on there. It started in 2011, right? Flattened places like Homs, Hama, parts at least of Aleppo. Uh, he's a horrible, horrible terrorist. Now understand, you know, people are going around, oh man, oh man, racist, we're racist over here. Of course, they're presumably not. We're look at how the Ukrainians are getting accepted, and the Syrians, oh, there are all sorts of, well, there weren't too many blocks and obstacles, uh, you, the, the Germans let in a million 
of them. And within a year, they were kind of regretting letting everyone be let in, in because there was a Zilvestanacht atrocity committed in many places in Europe. Many women were sexually assaulted on one day. And it was like mass sexual assault. Guys uh, circling women, encircling them, and uh, subjecting them to, well, it would be kind of like gang sexual assault. Horrible, horrible stuff. And that's the deal. That is the deal. That's the difference. See, the, uh, the Chechens, I don't know if there was much, uh, they had some mountains to run off to in the southern part of Chechnya. So it didn't become a worldwide crisis. That's the difference. The Ukrainians tend not to harbor, despite what Putin says, harbor terrorists or participate in terrorism or support terrorism. The Syrians, the folks that, were, uh, that came out of there, I've got my doubts about them. Who would they be supporting passively, at the very least? ISIS. Oh, I was talking to one recently. One refugee. We had a nice, friendly chat. And friendly enough so that he opened up to me. In Syria, the bad guys were, for him, the Russians and the Americans. Huh? mention of the Turks. And the Turks were the folks that were running ISIS. Oh. I didn't have the courage or maybe the foolhardiness to ask the guy what he thought of ISIS. So that's the difference. There's a huge difference. I don't think we want, well maybe maybe there's some folks out there who are there are people going around saying hey, Islam's awesome because it's they're the only ones who are standing and it's not just one source of running. They're the only ones who are willing to stand up to capitalism. Was the book good? This book is uh, pretty good. It's quite slim. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, it deals with, it only goes up to basically 2003, uh, the second edition. I don't know if there's much of a change. But, uh, you know, like you do get a pretty good perspective on what happened with like a flattening of the place. Flattening Chechnya. This is not new for him. He's not improvising. This is his backup plan. Figures are important. Apparently, he walked into the Ukraine with, and people are going, "Wow, that's a big army—190,000 soldiers." Now he's bringing in some backup troops. Hopefully, they're conscripts. As conscripts die, people who have their sons taxed, they start to get annoyed about it. But the the deal is, he walked into Chechnya with maybe, I don't know the exact population, 5 million people? With 100,000 people. And it took him four months to pacify it. So twice the number of, uh, twice the n number of soldiers, but 10 times maybe? Eight times the number of people to deal with. Theoretically, eight times the number of soldiers to deal with. He's in trouble. That's why I knew he was in trouble right away. Not the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are in trouble. They're going to lose a lot. But world, this includes you, China, People's Republic of China. He is your enemy. He wants to rule as much as he can grab. And if the whole world buckles under him, bends the knee to him, he will take over the whole world with 120 million people and nuclear weapons. He will take over the whole world if you let him. He's got to be stopped, and the sooner you stop him, the better it is. It's like dealing with Hitler. He would have taken over the whole world if England had let him, and the United States ultimately had let him. We're not talking about Russia. They were a joke in World War II. They were, they were on Hitler's side at the beginning of for the first uh, year and a half, two years almost. They were a joke, and uh, ultimately their big armies that you know they were doing blitzkrieg warfare. They were doing it on 50% of their 
troop transports were supplied by the Americans. What a joke. And that's their great patri patriotic war. They lost maybe 29 and a half million people, soldiers and civilians included, because of Stalin's pussyfooting around with Hitler at the beginning of World War II. So this is a book that's recommended because I'm afraid most people have no clue of what Putin's like. Okay, you have four minutes if four you minutes, want to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just mention there are okay. still people. The CBC had a phone-in program and uh, people were uh, texting in or, or stuff like that. There was some idiot who was saying, hey, you know, like, uh, this is just a move by NATO to extend American imperialism. You stupid, stupid sphincter. Now, I've known people who were saying that about Putin like eight years ago, and then, then uh, you know, like uh, he had a right to the Ukraine, they had a, a fair election in 2014, and, you know, the one person I can recall that was really squawking that, he found out that Manafort was uh, handling that. This was two years later, and I think he kind of started to change his tune a little bit. But as late as 2014, this is after Putin was doing the uh, war crimes in Syria and well after he's doing war crimes in Chechnya. Get smart. It's like that show in the, when was it, the 60s and stuff like that? With Don Adams. Get smart, you idiots. Read some stuff and then read it with some application. Read stuff that you don't like reading. I read all sorts of stuff that I don't like reading. I'll get around to this one. This is the Cuban view of uh, the JFK assassination. And you read this and the Cubans are the good guys. Of course, there are lots and lots of people this late in the day who still think that Castro, the Castro bros were really, really good and really think that Hugo Chavez was really, really good and Venezuela still good. Of course, Venezuela apparently was, maybe it was in a UN vote, was supporting Russia against the Ukraine. This year, yeah, they're the good guys in their own eyes. I think sometimes maybe even they uh, doubt it because uh, they've got to know that, uh, you know, their economy doesn't work. You look at the Venezuelan economy dripping in oil and they still can't run it. Or they do run it. They run it into the ground. Fun times. Fun times, even with huge oil resources, they can't do as well as their neighbors. And Colombia is a bit of a basket case. So there we go. Tune in for the Cuban view, the commie view of JFK, JFK's assassination. And it dates to 1994, I believe. Yep, there we go.